Not everybody loves you. Not everybody even notices you. What I'm saying is you need to know how you got to be who you are, whether you like yourself or whether you don't, because it's important that you understand your makeup. Nobody's perfect. Everybody has room to improve. Everybody has room to grow. And we all improve with clarity and understanding. Hey, everybody, it is time for chapter four of Living by Design. And I've got to say, I don't talk about things that I don't care about and am not passionate about, but there are some things that are more favorite to me than others. I have to say, this is the most favorite that I've talked about so far. And I'm going to tell you why. When you are in my profession, when you're in the field of psychology, mental health, you see everything. A lot of people can live in different lives, do different jobs, and not deal with the full range of human functioning. But when you do what I do, you see the good and the bad. And it causes you to be aware of what people are capable of, as I say, all the way up to the good side and all the way down to the bad and the dark side. I was quoted one time as saying, it's better to be awakened by a painful truth than lulled to sleep by a seductive lie. I really believe that. And I guess maybe I think we're a little bit of a Pollyanna society. Now, you're probably going to think that maybe I'm a pessimist or maybe I'm a little paranoid. The truth of the matter is I'm not. I'm actually an incurable optimist. But I'm an optimist because I think we can prepare for anything. We always hear that life is a game, and I agree with that. Life is a game. And you may think, oh, boy, it's not. You get a terminal disease or something, that's not a game. Yeah, it is. You have to be a player. Games aren't always funny. They're not always frivolous. They're not always for trivial stakes. Sometimes a game has stakes that are life or death, but they're still a game. In the game of life, I just have the belief that you're either going to be a player or you're going to be played. And my problem is if you're like me and you were raised by the kind of parents that I was raised by and came up through the educational system that I came up through, you were taught how the world should work not how the world does work. Now think about the difference. You were taught how the world should work. You're taught about how things are supposed to be. You're taught how things work if everything is fair. If you work hard, you're going to get your just rewards. And that on the playground, you always heard, cheaters never win and winners never cheat. Well, let me tell you, that is exactly where that belongs on a playground with children. Because if you think cheaters never win, wake up. Cheaters do win, and winners do cheat. Lance Armstrong. I mean, come on. Wake up. That is just simply a myth. So I was taught how the world was supposed to work, how the world should work, and then I got out there in the real world and found out how it did work, and it was a whole lot different than what I was taught. And here's the truth of the matter. Your life, just like my life, is full of bad people. Bad people. There's also a lot of good people in it, don't get me wrong, but it's full of bad people. And most of us, and I was guilty of this for a period of time, most of us are stagnant. We're unwilling to take the initiative to get bad people out of our lives. We let days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and we just let those bad people stay in our lives. They have bad karma. They don't wish us well. They don't want us to succeed. They're jealous if we do. They drag us down, suck us dry. They try to take what's ours and use it for their own benefit. They lie, cheat, steal, talk behind our back, gossip about us, sabotage us, they're two-faced, they betray us. We all have those kind of people in our lives because they hide in plain sight. They're just everywhere. 
you've got them in every category of your life. And I'm going to be asking you about that. I'm going to ask you to categorize your life, work, home, family, recreation, church, wherever, and just see if you can identify where these people are. What I want to do today is talk to you about how to spot them and how to defeat them. And knowledge is power, and I intend to give you plenty of both today. Plenty of knowledge and plenty of power. And that equips you to live in the world as it is, not as how it should be. Look, here's the deal. If you think this world is all hunky-dory, let me tell you, it's not. It's estimated right now that we have over 5,000 active cults operating in America, for example. It is estimated by the Federal Trade Commission that over half of the phone calls you receive this year are going to be scams. Now think about what I just said. One out of every two phone calls you get are going to be based on somebody trying to take what is yours. They're calling you to rob you. They're calling you to trick you, scam you, cheat you out of your money. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it preys upon the unsuspected, the uninformed. It preys upon the immigrant communities because they're new to America, and they don't know the system. They don't know the laws. But it's not just the immigrant community. It preys upon those that are unsuspecting and they're uninformed. Now, I can tell you one of the things that I've done with the two boys that Robin and I have raised, Jay and Jordan, is I started out from the very beginning, and I said, Boys, one thing I want to teach you is to always be situationally aware. Situationally aware. And by the way, I didn't raise my boys to be paranoid, to see the world as a scary place that they should shy away from. Quite the contrary. Both of my boys are very outgoing. They're very engaging. But they have confidence because they have awareness because they go in wide-eyed open at what can go wrong. But I always taught them about situational awareness. Even if they just go into a restaurant, I always taught them, as soon as you walk in the door, scan the room and find the most unstable person, the most dangerous person in the room, and keep an eye on them. Look for the exits in a room. Look for what can go wrong in a situation. And then go on about your business. Enjoy your dinner. Enjoy your evening, whatever you're doing. But be situationally aware. And you think, what, are you trying to raise a couple of James Bonds here? Well, yeah, sort of. Because I want them to be aware of what's going on. How about you? Do you get up in the morning and just kind of stumble around? Or are you situationally aware? I can tell you I am. I walk out on stage every day. I've got a live audience of 250 people. Now, trust me, they all go through a metal detector when they come in. We know their identities. We know who they are. They don't get to carry their purses in. They don't get to carry briefcases in. They don't get to carry backpacks in. We screen, screen, screen. But I also come out, and you better believe I'm scanning that audience to see if there's somebody in there that, although they may be unarmed, are they particularly unstable? I have a lot of stalkers. I have people that send letters, and they think I'm talking to them through the TV screen. And sure enough, across the years, I've had people jump out of their seats and charge the stage. I had my eyes out, and I knew what was going on, so I was prepared. And I have a lot of security around at the same time. You may not have the benefit of security, so be your own. You have to be situationally aware. Now, I promise you, 100% of the communities in the United States are targeted by people that are trying to scam, trying to steal, trying to rob, doing whatever they can to victimize you. Every American, every adult in America is targeted in some way by somebody that has ill will towards them. You will not go through the next week without somebody that wishes you ill will. They're either trying to take your money or your health, your property, your job, your husband or your wife, whatever. 
So just know that it's out there. Now you're thinking, man, you're scaring me here. You're making me think we're just in a really bad society. No, we're not. But we're in a society that has bad elements. I want to talk to you about getting what you want and keeping what you have. So I am trying to get your attention. Look, I love life, but not everything in it. I love people, but not all of them. Hell, I love myself, but not everything about me. Nothing is all one way or another. And there is power in having a crystal clear view of reality. So yes, I do want you to be situationally aware. I do want you to pay attention. Now, I gave you the example of being situationally aware when you come into a room. That's environmentally. Are you situationally aware about the people in your life? Do you know who in your life is not a fan? Do you know who in your life is your enemy? Do you know who in your life is trying to exploit you, stab you in the back, hurt you in some way? Trust me, when you know that, you can be prepared and you are a whole lot less apt to become a victim. Now, let me tell you the number one tool of muggers, for example, and I've interviewed a lot of muggers. You know what their number one tool is? Surprise. They tell me that they'll walk up to somebody on the street at night, and the first thing they say is something like, hey, what time do you have? Because we're unsuspecting, and because we're polite and because we're courteous, what's the first thing you do when somebody says, hey, what time do you have? The first thing you do is you lift up your left wrist and you look down. Okay, so now you've taken your eyes off the person in front of you, put your head down, and put your hand in a position that's hard to defend yourself. In that second, they strike. And the muggers tell me two things. Number one, they've now incapacitated the person because they've gotten them to take their eye off the ball. And they say then they've got about a five-second window when the person is in denial. They say they're in denial about what's happening. They're saying, oh, my God, I'm getting mugged here. Somebody just hit me in the head. Somebody just knocked me up beside the head. And it takes them that long to realize Oh my God, I'm being mugged. And in that time, they're able to get the advantage. They rely on our denial, our unwillingness to accept that something bad can happen and is happening to them. That's what I'm trying to say to you right now to not let happen to you. That's why I'm talking about crystal clarity when you're viewing reality and situational awareness about the people around you and your environment. I want you to be street smart. Now, let me tell you how I want you to think about these people in your life. I want to give you a name for them. They're called baiters. Baiter. B-A-I-T-E-R. Baiter. B stands for backstabber. A stands for abuser. I stands for imposter, T stands for taker, E stands for exploiter, and R stands for reckless. Baiter. That's a new word. That's a new term I want you to put in your vocabulary because I want you to find the baiters in your life. And let me tell you how I came up with this. The goal in psychology is to differentiate one pathology from another. So we want to differentiate depression from anxiety. We want to differentiate an antisocial personality from a borderline personality. We want to differentiate those. You know why? Because insurance companies require us to differentiate them so we have a code we can write down so we can bill. Because you've got to write down a code and then you send it in and they pay you money for that. So we've got to put people in pigeonholes. But the truth is, those are false boundary lines. People don't fit in nice little holes 
where you can differentiate one from the other. So what I wanted to do is I started out by saying, okay, let me go back through my life and look at the people that have victimized me along the way. Let me look at the people that have cheated, lied, stolen, sabotaged, gossip, in some way acted to my detriment, and let me see if they have common traits and elements. I, I'm not going to try to differentiate and put them in pigeonholes. What do they all have in common, if anything? I have to say I was a little surprised at how much they had in common. First off, there were more than I realized. I can find this just to my adult life. I didn't go back to childhood because, you know, you have a lot of childhood tiffs and stuff. And maybe some people have me on their baiter list. I don't know. But I made a list of baiters. And I was surprised how many had been in my life, in my profession, how many had been in my personal life, how many were in my family. But I wrote them down, and then I started saying, okay, what was the characteristic that defined this person? Now this person. Now this person. And then I started crossing out those that were specific to that person and kept only those things that cut across all of them. Boy, was there a list. And it's what made up baiters. They were all backstabbers. None of them had the guts, the courage, the spine to come at you head on. They were all backstabbers. They would sneak around and come at you when you weren't looking. And all of them were abusers. You give them an inch, they would take a mile. You trust them a little bit, they would exploit that. You give them a little bit of access to your life, they would really get inside and just take advantage of everything you gave them access to. They were all imposters. None of them were who they presented themselves to be. They all had a false presentation. Nobody came as who they really were. They all had this facade that they put out, pretending to be somebody they weren't. You know, you can divide people in a lot of categories, givers and takers. And every one of these people was a taker. When you looked at the pattern of your relationship with them across one year, two years, five years, they were takers. They were always taking, 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 and never giving anything back. And they were all exploiters. No matter what situation you put them in, they always found a way to make it benefit themselves. Didn't matter what the cost was to you, they would cause you to lose $10,000 to make 500 for themselves. They would cause you to lose a job to put themselves in a good light with somebody they thought could maybe help them down the line. And they were all reckless. They were reckless with your name. They were reckless with your relationship. They were reckless with your property. They were reckless with your money. They were reckless with your children. They were reckless with your relationship. It didn't matter. They were just reckless with anything that had to do with you. Now, think about that. What people do you have in your life that fit into that category? Backstabbers, abusers, imposters, takers, exploiters, reckless. Write it down. These are people for whom the means are justified by the end. You know, I've always said integrity means you do the right thing when nobody's looking. But for a baiter, it just means they have free reign. Nobody's looking. They can do whatever they want. It just makes it easier for them. Who in your life is that way? Let me give you a simple example. Now, you think life is fair, and let's say that you and another lady at work, you're both up for a promotion. And you're thinking, well, the thing to do is just work hard, put my best foot forward. I'll stand on my work. I'm good with that. I'll just let my work do the talking for me. And when I get a chance to do the interview, I'll do it. I'll just throw my hat in the ring. Let me tell you what a baiter will do. A baiter will find out where the boss goes to church. And a baiter will show up at the boss's church and just inadvertently run into the boss. 
and say, oh, Mrs. Jackson, I didn't know you went to church here. It's so good to see you. How's everything? And they just manipulate the situation to get some face time with the boss one-on-one. Compliment the boss. Play up to the boss. It's a manipulation. It's getting outside the workplace to create some intimacy, some extra exposure. Now, is that cheating? Well, I don't know. In court, we call that ex parte. If one lawyer meets with the judge without the other lawyer there, uh, that's a violation of ethics. But in life, we don't have that rule, so somebody just might go ahead and do that. They find out what their patterns are. They find out what their interests are. They just start creating all these intersections in life with the boss where they create a familiarity. They just might turn the conversation to you, backstab you just a little bit. And they might do it in a backhanded way, and it'll seem like faint praise or something, and say, I was actually late getting here today because I had to finish up a project at the office. I mean, I was doing it with Cheryl, but I don't know. I guess she just went MIA. I I don't. I mean, maybe you know. I don't know. But I, I I'm not saying about her. I'm just saying I. I that's why I came in late. I, you know, they just find a way to just kind of work it around. They're just really, really good at manipulating the situation. So, who in your life? just always seems to manipulate things. Who in your life is an imposter? They present things one way, but not another. I tell you, this happened to me at a really critical time in my life. I was starting my practice back in the early 1970s. Well, I was a young master of the universe. I was going to stamp out disease and suffering. I was going to heal all the suffering in the world. I was working 20 hours a day sometimes. I'd go to the office and see all the patients in the world, and I'd go to the hospital and make rounds with this neurosurgeon I was working with, and just so busy that I thought, unlike a lot of psychologists at the time that would just have an answering machine and see seven or eight patients a day, I was seeing way, way more than that. I was running groups and had a hospital census and all of this, and I had to have other therapists on staff. I had to have an administrator that ran the office and had two or three receptionists up front. So I ran across this lady that I thought was really, really sharp. She had five kids and her husband was a businessman there in town. And if I was going to describe her to you, it would be like Aunt B. You know, from the Andy Griffith show, she kind of wore her hair like that. She looked like Aunt B. In fact, we called her Aunt B in an affectionate sort of way because she was just so loving and caring. She never came to work without some Tupperware thing full of something she had cooked for somebody. I mean, she'd bring it in there, and she had cookies. She baked bread. She just always taking care of everybody, and she's patting everybody. And honest to God, she was the choir director at a huge church. She had five boys. All five boys were in the choir. She did volunteer work at the church. If the church door was open, she was in it. She was down there on Wednesday for adult programs. She was down there on Saturday. She was there on Sunday morning, Sunday evening. She did training unions. She ran youth groups. She just did everything. And she talked about her faith all the time. She wasn't preaching all the time, but she talked about her faith all the time to the point that you'd kind of make a U-turn if you saw her coming sometimes, if you were like really busy. And I had this nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach. I just didn't know exactly what it was, but I had this nagging feeling I'm going to be honest with you, I really got down on myself about that because I thought, now, come on, you're judging Aunt B. I really got on myself about it. I thought, you know what? You're judging her because she's more spiritual than you are. You're judging her because you feel inadequate. You feel inferior because she's more spiritual than you are. She's a better parent than you are. You just feel intimidated by what a good family person she is. And I kind of wrote it off to that. But it just kind of kept eating away at me. And I got to know her husband a little bit. 
We had gone to lunch one day, her husband and I, and we were in a restaurant downtown and the bill came and I put my credit card down and pretty soon the guy came back pretty sheepishly and he knew me and he said, Dr. McGraw, I'm sorry, but your credit card's been rejected. And I said, excuse me? And he said, I, your credit card's been rejected. And I said, well, <laughs> there's got to be some mistake. Run it again. Because I'd have never paid a penny of interest on my credit cards ever. I use them instead of carrying cash, and I pay them off every month. So there's no way. And he says, well, I'm sorry. I ran it. And so her husband, he sees I'm perplexed and embarrassed. And so he puts some cash down. He said, hey, this one's on me. And uh, he said, you can get the next one. And I'm like, oh, man. I can just tell you, Aunt B is going to tear them a new one. I mean, because she's all over this. She will take this personal. Whatever has happened here, this is right up her alley. They've made a mistake, and she's going to make them pay for it because she takes pride in this. She is going to be all over them. I get in the car with him, and I say, let me tell you, your wife is going to tear somebody up down at the credit card company. And... He knows I'm kind of embarrassed, so he's just kind of looking out the window and says, well, I guess it happens. So we get back. He drops me off, and I go in and tell her what happened. And she says, oh, my word, I can't even believe that. Oh, here, let me have it. I'll take care of this right away. So I go back, and I can't figure it out. Now, you have to understand, at the time, I'm pretty young. I've got an accountant that by that time I've had him for like 10, 15 years. I've now had him for 45 years, the same accountant. I'm just thinking about this. So I give Danny a call and I'm just talking to him, telling him what happened and how embarrassed it was because he and I are really good friends. I tell him what happened. And he says, well, good grief. That just can't be right. He said, I'm up front. Let me go back to my office. He puts me on hold. And when he put me on hold, my life changed in the next 30 seconds. My values changed. My beliefs changed. My life changed forevermore in the next 30 seconds. Here's what happened. I was on line three. Understand, this was 1970. This is one of those phones where it had five lines. You push the buttons across the phone. Line two was lit up. I assume it's Aunt B talking to the credit card company, and I'm on line three. When he puts me on hold, all of a sudden, I can hear the conversation on line two. Never happened before, never happened since. Don't know how, don't know why. But I can hear the conversation on line two kind of like a radio playing in a scratchy but very discernible way. And here's what I heard. Let me tell you something, you bitch. If you're doing this again, I swear to God, I'll put you in jail myself. If you're playing with that man's money, I swear to God, you bitch, I will kill you where you sit. And I hear Aunt B saying, I swear I'm not doing it. And he's saying, I don't believe a damn word you're saying. You're a lying bitch. I know it. I know it. I know it. And then Danny picked the phone up, and it went away. I just went into a cold sweat. And I told Danny, I said, you're not going to believe what just happened. I related this story to him, and he said, I'll be right over. He came over, and I went through this with him again. And he does my books, and he says, look, your books are balanced. There's, there's no way. Your books are balanced to the penny. I call Aunt B back there. I set her down, and I said, look, is there something you want to tell me? And she said, well, what? I mean, my gosh, what are you talking about? And I said, listen, 
you need to tell me what's going on financially here because there's no way what just happened with that credit card was an accident. And she said, well, I don't know what you mean. I then related to her verbatim because it was burned in my brain, the conversation I overheard her having with her husband. She dropped her head and started crying. And in the next 20 minutes, she disclosed that she had embezzled $600,000 from me beginning the day she had started working there. I had purchased two cars for two of the five boys she had, paid a year lease on an apartment for one of the boys. She had embezzled all of this money. And the way she did it is if the bills for that month were $47,000, she would write out $47,000 worth of bills, have me sign them, go put them in a drawer and withdraw exactly to the penny that amount of money and give it to herself. The account balance to the penny. So not only had she embezzled $600,000, but I was now $600,000 in arrears on all of my bills. So that was $1.2 million that was gone. Let's go back to the Bader list. Backstabber, all behind my back. Abuser. She had a position of power, and she abused that power. I trusted her with the bank accounts and the bank books. Imposter. She presented herself as this self-righteous church lady. Taker. Yeah. She took $600,000. Exploiter. She had access to the bank, the bank accounts. I introduced her to my banker, to my accountant, and she was reckless. She took that money and spent it like a drunken sailor on shore leave. Bader. Right under my nose, and I'm supposed to be Mr. Situationally Aware and see all of this stuff, right under my nose. Who in your life could be doing that same thing to you? I sat down after that, absolutely in shock. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I couldn't believe I was hearing it. But both were true. Now, I said that I deal with life as good as it gets and as bad as it gets. Danny Moore, who just passed away not terribly long ago from cancer, only accountant I ever had for 45 years, knew my financial situation because, like I said, he was my accountant, knew what a pickle I was in without asking because he knew I wouldn't allow it, actually left my office, got his people, came back, did a quick audit, found out how much damage she had done, and without saying a word, took out a second mortgage on his home and his office building and got $600,000 and brought all my bills current and then came in and told me, all right, you're all caught up. Now we just have to figure out what to do next. So what do you mean I'm all caught up? He said, look, you got enough to worry about digging this out. I got that covered. We'll take care of it later. We'll swear about that later. I mean, I'm dumbfounded. I'm in shock. So when I say I deal with the dark side, but I'm definitely an optimist, that's how good of a friend people can be. To finish the story, she actually had an inheritance that she had coming, and her parents stepped in and refunded all of that money. So Danny got whole, and I got whole, and by the grace of God, we got out of that. Shows you how good a friend can be. So I do see the upside of this. 
but right under my own nose, there was a baiter. I want you to scan your life. Look at your family. Look at your friends. Look at the people you work with, people you go to church with. On drfillintheblanks.com, I'm going to have some worksheets there for you to look at. I'm going to have baiters listed out with their characteristics. I'm going to have some worksheets there where you can actually make some lists of the people in your lives and go through and evaluate each one of them and see where they fall. Are they on that list or are they not? Because if you actually don't affirmatively look to try to find out who in this life is a baiter, you cannot eliminate them from your life. This is something you have to affirmatively do. And trust me, these are people that walk among us every day. We see these family annihilators, almost a hundred since 1980. Family annihilators that live next door to you one day, and then they kill their wives and all their children, and then usually themselves just one day out of the blue, and everybody goes, oh, my God, I I didn't see that coming. These people live among us. They hide in plain sight, and that's what you have to pay attention to. And you've got to be affirmative in getting them out of your life. Now, what I want to do now is I want to tell you how they do what they do so you understand how they get to you. I told you who they are, baiters. Now I want to tell you how they do what they do, and it's what I call the evil eight. The evil eight. These are the characteristics that these people have that make them so dangerous. Again, the evil eight are things that were present consistently among all the people that I found in my life that had qualified as baiters. And I got in a lot of trouble over this, actually, because I wasn't planning on doing this. I had a flip chart back in my office at home, and I was writing on it, and then I'd tear a sheet off and tape it up on the wall, tear another sheet off and tape it up on the wall. And Robin came back there and found out I'd taped all this stuff up on the wall. (laughs) She was not real happy because when I pulled that tape off the wall, sometimes it took the finish with it. So I got in trouble over that. But she actually got into the project and was really, really very helpful and added a few people of her own. And these are the things that were consistently there. Evil eight. Number one, arrogant entitlement. These people have an arrogant entitlement about them. They actually believe they are entitled to what they do. They think they are entitled to what they think. And when you catch them, they are not remorseful. They are arrogant about it. They think they are entitled to what is yours. If you have worked hard, if you have gained something, if they take your job from you by cheating and going around you to the boss or whatever, they think they are entitled to do that. And if they've cheated to do it, they just think that's just the rules of the game. The rules of the game are there are no rules. Survival of the fittest. I got your job. I got your money. You should have been more alert. It's not my fault that you didn't watch me. It's not my fault you didn't catch me. I'm entitled to this. You should have been smarter. You should have caught me sooner. Listen, that's their attitude. Number two, they have a complete lack of empathy. When they do it, they don't have the ability to stand in your shoes and recognize what impact this has on your life. Now, this is different from number three, which is no remorse or guilt, because they have no remorse or guilt. The lack of empathy is they can't tell you what their actions have done to you. That's different from not being sorry. They can't tell you what it did to you. They don't realize when I cheated you out of this money, I stole this money or took your job or cheated with your spouse. You took me in and I raped your daughter. 
you gave me a place to live and I seduced your 14-year-old daughter, they have no empathy for you. They don't have the ability to say, oh my God, I opened my home to this person and they seduced and had sex with my daughter. So now I feel like I have failed as a father because my job is to protect my children and I failed to protect my children. In fact, I brought evil into the home. Now I feel a failure as a father. They don't have the ability to put themselves in your shoes and recognize what that's done to your self-worth and your self-esteem. Number three, they have no guilt or remorse for putting you in that position, which is different from understanding the position. They have no guilt or remorse for putting you in the position they don't understand. How can they feel sorry for something they don't understand? So they have no remorse or guilt. This is how it makes them hard to detect because people that have guilt or remorse, they'll start to show changes in their behavior. They'll start to show uneasiness or depression or an inability to look you in the eye or they'll start to withdraw. But because these people have no empathy, remorse, or guilt, you'll see no change in behavior whatsoever. They will go in and statutory rape your daughter at 6.30 and sit down at the dinner table with you at 7 and have no indication that they have transgressed in any way whatsoever. They have that ability. Number four. They are irresponsible and self-destructive. I've had the Secret Service on presidential detail tell me before that if somebody is willing to give their own life to assassinate the president of the United States, there's no way you can stop them. If somebody's going to try to shoot the president or assassinate the president and get away, then you've got a chance to protect the president because you can anticipate where a shooter might try to hide or where a bomber might try to operate from. But if somebody is willing to die in order to take out a target, it's almost impossible to protect the target. That's why it's so dangerous for the suicide bombers that we've encountered in the most recent wars in the Middle East, because If they're willing to die, then they can just walk up to a rope line or whatever, and when the target comes by, boom. These people are that irresponsible and that self-destructive. They don't have the ability to protect themselves. They're that self-destructive. And you say, well, they wouldn't do that. They'll go to jail. That doesn't register with them. They don't have that self-preservation gene. and Somehow or another, they seem to get away with this a tremendous amount of time. Number five, they thrive on drama. These people like turmoil, chaos, upheaval, drama. So they're happy to create big scenes at work, big scenes in the family, big fights among relatives. They thrive on this. It makes them feel important that they're able to get a reaction out of somebody on the other side. They thrive on this. They need this. It's what fuels them. It moves their needle. So you would think that most people would not want to be in that kind of a pressure cooker. Not these people. No, they thrive on this. They want this upheaval. They want to have a big scene where you find out They're sleeping with your wife or your husband. You find out that they've gone behind your back at work. They thrive on that drama because they like to be the center of attention. And they think if they're the target here and there's all this flap about them, they love that. They need it. They want it. Number six, they brag about outsmarting people. They will actually come to you and con you in to letting them move in with you, give them a place to stay, and actually let you become part of your family-owned business 
and then brag to you about how they outsmarted and conned the last person they were in business with. I kid you not. They will not have any empathy. They don't have the ability to put themselves in your shoes, so they will get into your business and talk to you about how they destroyed the last person they were in business with. Now, you would think, how dumb is that? Well, it may be dumb to you, but they are so narcissistic that they think this is a quality and they cannot help but crow about it, strut about it, pat themselves on the back about it. It never occurs to them, wait a minute, I'm telling my current target what I did to my last target. Then if you say something to them about, oh, I would never do that to you. I mean, this guy was, he was so dumb, he was asking for it. Number seven, if you look at their history, you're going to see a lot of short-term relationships. They never stick. You're going to find they worked here for a little while, there for a little while, there for a little while. They were in this relationship, then this relationship, then this one, then this one. There's always an excuse. There's always a reason. They're always the victim. But for whatever reason, they never have a sustained relationship. They hop from one job to another, one relationship to another, one family member to another, one dwelling to another. Everything is short term because they either get found out or they pick them clean and move on to a new target. And number eight, they live in a fantasy world. They are delusional. And if you go to the trouble to start checking who they say they are, what they say they've done, what they say they've accomplished, and how they did it, you will find out it is a house of cards. You know, there was just recently a story about this heiress that pretended to be an heiress and supposedly conned innkeepers and bankers in New York out of hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. And you think, how in the world could that happen? Because she was a baiter, and the I in baiter is imposter. And when somebody started looking past the facade and ask even the most basic questions, required even the most fundamental documentation, she didn't have enough to fill up a gum wrapper. And she was within days of getting a $60 million loan. They live in a fantasy world, and they are delusional, and they actually start to believe, like a method actor, the story they're telling. They start talking about being royalty. They start thinking they're royalty. They start expecting people to believe it because they're so narcissistic. And when it's all over, people are so red-faced because you say, well, did you ever ask a question? Did you ever? Somebody came in here, and it's kind of like the movie Catch Me If You Can, where he was a doctor and a lawyer and airline pilot. And people say, did you ever ask to see a transcript? Did you ever call the university? Did you ever look for a pilot's license? Well, no. Why? Well, he had on a uniform. Well, you know you can get those down at the corner uniform shop, right? Oh, yeah. We take people at face value. And that's a big mistake. I was raised to give people the benefit of the doubt because I was raised to deal with this world as it should work, not as it does work. And I think approaching life where you give people the benefit of the doubt is a higher form of insanity. Why would you do that? You shouldn't decide they're evil until they prove they aren't, nor should you decide they're good people until they prove they aren't. What you should do is go in 
with an open mind in data collection mode and just start gathering information until you reach critical mass and you have enough information to make an informed decision. You know, I lived in Texas for a long, long time before I moved to California, and I was there in the oil boom. And I always had these oil promoters coming up and saying, Hey, Doc, got a great oil deal for you here. We want you to invest in these eight wells we're drilling out in West Texas. Of course, they're promoters, so they're going to get carried in the deal. You know, you put your money in and you get an eighth of the well, and then they get carried for a 30-second from every person that invests, so they get a free ride. You know, it's, it's going to be the greatest thing in the world. First question I always ask, how much money you got? You know, if you're great at this, then I assume you have a lot of money. Give me your banker's name. Let me talk to your banker. I want to know how much money you got. And they're like, well, hey, come on. I rolled up here in a Lincoln Continental. I got on a solid gold Rolex. What's that tell you? That tells me you got a lot of bills, buddy. What I want to do is talk to your banker. And if your banker tells me you got half the money that you tell me you're going to make me, then maybe we'll talk. But if he tells me you had not got two dimes to rub together, then you need to hit the bricks, buddy. And you know what? They never came back. When I asked the first question, if you're such a big oil man, tell me how much money you got. Just by asking a few simple questions. But everybody likes to hear a big story. And I sure wanted to own some big oil wells, but I sure did want to keep the money I worked hard to make. So I asked a few questions before I made up my mind. And they just didn't have any answers. So here's what I'm wanting you to do. I'm wanting you to be street smart. I'm wanting you to say, you know what? I'm going to go back and do an audit on my life. I'm going to go back and say, you know what? These people that don't pass the test don't deserve to be in my life, and I'm going to cut them out. If I got baiters in my life, if I've got people that practice the evil eight, they need to do it somewhere else. I've said many times, you can call me a bitch, but you're going to do it long distance. You're not going to do it in my kitchen. You're not going to do it in my backyard. You're not going to do it in my business. You can do that somewhere else. You're not going to do it in my circle. Life is hard enough if you got everybody trying to push that rock up the hill. It's really hard if you got three or four people there trying to trip the people who are trying to push the rock up the hill. Make sure everybody in your life is trying to push that rock up the hill. Everybody in your life ought to be wishing you to succeed. Everybody in your life ought to be trying to contribute to your success and you theirs. You help the people in your life, and the people in your life ought to be helping you. You should help your friends. Your friends should help you. And if you can't say that about the people in your life, give them their walk-in papers. I promise you. They will not be missed. Ask yourself, who has tried to infiltrate themselves into your life? Who are the frauds? Who are the cheaters? Who are the two-faced gossips? Who are the people that just seemed to have to have that drama? Life's too short. It's time to thin the herd. We'll talk again. I'm Dr. Phil. Phil.